Välkomna ska ni vara till dagens forskning i framkantsseminarium. Uh, and I will now switch to English. It's an honor to introduce Abel de Munch that has uh, come here from the US. And his background is a cardiologist as well as a vascular biologist. And you're going to talk about angiogenesis. Yes. Welcome. Thank you very much for the uh, very kind introduction. We're going to talk about molecular imaging of angiogenesis, where the vascular leukocytes play an important role. And you will hear about the role of the vascular leukocytes once the paper is published. So for now, we're going to focus on the imaging part of the story. Uh, this is very much a work in progress. Um, and I thank you all for, for coming here. And, um, by, by a little bit further introduction, uh, I come from this country, which everybody, of course, recognizes as the Netherlands. I spent eight years in the US, and uh, we've moved to this beautiful country in August last year, and uh, I am very happy to be here. Um, this was where I uh, spent the last eight years. This is uh, Hanover, New Hampshire at Dartmouth Medical School. Over here, uh, it's the smallest and least known of the Ivy Leagues. Uh, and this is the university hospital uh, that's affiliated with the medical school. The hospital is over there. And our house was in the middle of the woods a little bit to the north. Not only life worked here, I also worked there. And my lab was in this building. Um, as uh, Professor Lenna mentioned, my background is in cardiology. It's in interventional cardiology. And uh, there are some of my colleagues who say that we, as interventional cardiologists, don't use our brains. And to explain that a little bit more is the reason they say that is because when we see a stenosis on an angiogram, we observe it with our eyes. But then all the information bypasses the brain and sets into motion a very complicated set of uh, treatments that saves lives, but according to some people, doesn't need the frontal cortex. Just to set the stage a little bit, tell you a little bit about my background. So now, <coughs> angiogenesis. Angiogenesis uh, is defined as the sprouting of capillaries from pre-existing vessels. OK, so here is a vascular tree. And then in response to hypoxia, HIF1-alpha, VEGF, and a whole host of other cytokines, these blood vessels start to sprout from these pre-existing branches. Where do we find angiogenesis? Basically, any inflammatory response. I'm going to take you back to your med school days where we all learned a little bit of Latin, right? Rubor, calor, redness, and warmth is caused to a large extent by angiogenesis. Tumor, the swelling of a wound, the swelling in the site of inflammation, is caused to a large extent by angiogenesis. Why? Because when these capillaries grow in their initial stages, they're leaky. So fluid leaks out, swelling, tumor. Dolor, of course, <coughs> is the, other, the fourth item of inflammation, and that is not caused by angiogenesis. So inflammation. For example, in a healing wound after a myocardial infarction, every myocardial infarction goes through an inflammatory stage before ultimately it heals and a scar is formed that reinforces the ventricular wall and prevents the heart from rupture. When the artery becomes blocked, Tissue dies, and there is a massive influx of macrophages, neutrophils, and T lymphocytes. 
And this is the phase that you're seeing here. So after the injury, but before the scar formation. And this is the phase that we will be looking at further along in the talk. And other very interesting and very important setting of angiogenesis is in the setting of atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis, the root cause of practically every myocardial infarction, every stroke, is an inflammatory process. And as part of this inflammation, angiogenesis occurs. Here is a cartoon from a paper by my uh, friend and uh, <coughs> colleague, Rohit Kurana. Uh, and basically, this is uh, a plaque as it grows. And as the size of the lesion grows, these branches sprout from pre-existing vessels in the adventitia into the plaque. Now, molecular imaging of angiogenesis. How do we do this? How can we visualize these sprouting capillaries? We take advantage of a very convenient biological phenomenon, and that is when these capillaries start to sprout, when they start to grow, they express molecules on their surface, alpha V beta 3, CD13, VEGFR2, and there's at least 10 more that are not present when the endothelial cells are quiescent. Okay? This is important. This is what the story is about today. So, Everybody needs to make sure that they understand this, right? Okay, once again, these blood vessels, they're not sprouting. They don't have VEGFR2, CD13, and alpha V beta 3. These branches that are actively growing, penetrating into the tissue, have these molecules. The nice thing about these molecules is that you can target them. You can make peptide sequences that specifically recognize these molecules. You can also use antibodies or antibody fragments. We like peptide sequences because they're easy to make, they're easy to store, and they're cheap. There's one peptide sequence, N for asparagine, G for glycine, R for arginine, three amino acids, right? Biochemistry, first year med school, amino acids, and this peptide sequence binds CD13. Okay? So we have a tool, we have a peptide that recognizes CD13, and CD13 is only expressed on actively growing capillaries. We wanted to establish proof of principle that this was true, that we could target specifically angiogenic vessels in a healing wound. I'm a cardiologist, so we worked in the mouse myocardial infarction model. And this is just a picture to show how good the techs are in the lab. They can create a myocardial infarction in a heart this small, under microscope. This is a human heart, left ventricular hypertrophy, just for the dramatic effect this patient had an aortic stenosis. But still, the size difference is pretty big. <coughs> the way we do this is we put a ligature around the LAD, the left anterior descending coronary artery. This is the, the heart, has two arteries, a right and a left. Cardiology is easy. The left coronary artery has two branches. One is the circumflex that goes around the heart to the back. The other is the left anterior descending that descends along the front portion of the left ventricle. It is the most important branch in the coronary system. We tie off this left anterior descending coronary artery at a location three millimeters below the appendage of the left atrium. <coughs> 
Two weeks later, it looks like this. Massively remodeled left ventricle with a lot of scar. This is the end result. Again, we're not interested in the end result. We're interested in the inflammatory healing phase that is, occurs at one week after we tied off this artery. So that is where we will focus our attention. I've introduced CD13 to you a little bit. I just would like to introduce the molecule a little bit more. We will not go into its function. It's a homodimer. It is large. It's 150 to 170 kilodaltons in size. And <clears throat> it has a very short cytoplasmic tail, so it does not signal. It sits on the outside surface of cells. The reason why this molecule has a number is because it was first discovered as an antigen on myeloid cells. People were looking for antibodies that recognize myeloid cells versus lymphoid cells to be able to differentiate between myeloid and lymphoid leukemia. So in the early 80s, people identified <coughs> this antigen on myeloid leukemic cells that bound, conveniently bound a set of antibodies, and that was helpful in differentiating myeloid versus lymphoid leukemia. They didn't know what it was, so they just gave it a number. CD stands for cluster of differentiation, and now there's more than 200 CD molecules, so you can see that this one has been around for a long time. Then another group just took a closer look at the molecule and said, okay, this is a big molecule. We would like to see if it does something. And then they discovered that the molecule that people were targeting in myeloid leukemia was the same as an enzyme that had been known for a long time, and the name of the enzyme is aminopeptidase N. So in the literature, typically you see the abbreviation CD13 slash APN, aminopeptidase. What does this enzyme do on sprouting capillaries? Here's my hypothesis. We don't know, but my hypothesis is the function of this enzyme is that it clips off amino acids off of larger peptides, and it clips off these amino acids at the amino terminus of these larger peptides, and it has a preference for neutral amino acids, hence the N. So one hypothesis that we would like to test in the lab is that this enzyme sits at the tip of sprouting capillaries and eats away at the extracellular matrix to help the capillaries, thank you, to help the capillaries move into the extravascular space. This is a hypothesis. We now may have the tools to test this hypothesis, <coughs> but that is beyond the uh, topic of this talk. This is the peptide sequence that recognizes CD13. We did not discover this. There was a group in tumor biology that discovered that this peptide sequence sticks to tumors. Then they looked at where it stuck in the tumor and they found out that it was CD13, which is on the capillaries that are growing in the tumors. So we also find it in tumor angiogenesis, okay? I'm a cardiologist, so we're going to stick with the heart attacks and the atherosclerosis. It also is in corneal angiogenesis. I would just like to mention, because this is of relevance for another experiment that I hope to do with one of my colleagues in the ophthalmology lab. <coughs> um, this is the homing sequence two cysteines, a disulfide bond, and then there is a polylysine tail, and this is very convenient because basically you can stick anything 
to this polylysine tail. So we started with the fluorescent molecule, Oregon green, and we stuck it to the NGR, and we could make hearts glow in the dark, which was pretty cool. These are three groups of animals, <coughs> seven days after myocardial infarction. There are mice. The chest has been opened so we can see the heart. They're intubated and ventilated. And <coughs> above the heart is a CCD camera. There's a catheter in their jugular vein. And we inject either NGR linked to the fluorescent, the fluorescent only, or NGR linked to the fluorescent again. This is a control group. These animals had sham surgery, no infarction. This group, the animals had an infarct, but they were injected with the fluorescent only. And these animals had an infarct, and they were injected with the targeted fluorescence. Now here we see nice glow in the area of the infarct. And you will say, yes, here's, there's fluorescence too here as well. But if you take a closer look, this fluorescence is outside the MI area. This is an epicardial adhesion, which we see very often because of the inflammation in these healing hearts. The heart sticks to the chest wall, so there's a lot of fibrin. So this is the autofluorescence coming off of the fibrin. The infarct area proper does not light up. So how specific is this? Well, one step towards answering that question is <coughs> that we looked at fluorescence intensity. So we compared fluorescence coming off of the right ventricle, which was our baseline level, to the increase in fluorescence in the left ventricle after we injected the targeted fluorescent molecule. And you can see that the fluorescence in the left ventricle stays above baseline up to 12 hours after injection. But then when we come and we inject a 20-fold higher dose of NGR only without the fluorescent molecule, we see that we can compete off the fluorescence off of the binding sites. And fluorescence is back to baseline within one hour and 15 minutes as compared to that. So at least, so there's reversible binding and NGR binds something specific, right? Does it bind CD13? Well, <clears throat> to answer that question, we took a very, very powerful high-resolution res microscopy technique. And this was work that we did in Maastricht before I moved to the US. And this was with my, um, uh, my colleagues at the Cardiovascular Research Institute in Maastricht. And here, we took quantum dots, which are basically nanoparticles that have a very narrow emission spectrum when you hit them with the laser beam. So they, they are very specific. They emit a very narrow bandwidth of fluorescence when you excite them, which is very convenient because this allows for very specific location and it also allows for very specific uh, subtraction of the background fluorescence, which is pretty high in the infarcted area. This is an animal that was injected in vivo, so while it still was alive, again the jugular catheter, with an antibody against CD31, PCAM, platelet, and the thelial cell adhesion molecule, a standard endothelial marker. And the animal also was injected with NGR that was linked to a quantum dot that emits in the green spectrum. We're looking at the infarct area here, and all the red structures here are blood vessels, and the green blobs are the quantum dots 
that have been decorated with NGR. Now, if you look at higher magnification, you will see that the green from the quantum dot is still separate from the red from the endothelial marker. So there's no overlap between the quantum dot and this endothelial marker. So this quantum dot apparently is sitting on something else. It's not sitting on PCAM. We took another animal. Well, these, again, these were groups of four animals. We took another animal. Here, an antibody against CD13 in green, and quantum dots in red. And now you can see that there are areas of green and red, but there are also areas of yellow. So here, the quantum dot is overlapping with the green from the CD13. So it's co-localizing with the CD13. If we look outside the infarct area, healthy myocardium, we see no binding of quantum dots, even though CD13 is there at very low levels. <coughs> so CD13, we were the first ones to show. The tumor folks always are ahead of us, but at least for the heart, we were the first ones to show that CD13 is present on angiogenic capillaries, that we can target it, and that it does not bind on quiescent vessels. So pretty specific. So we were very proud of ourselves. But then there was this editorial in CERC, and it's, it's pretty old, 2005, but the message is still as pertinent today as it was at the time. Flor de Lisa, Villanueva, molecular images of neovascularization, art for art's sake or form with a function. Are we only making pretty pictures? Or will we be able to translate this into a clinical tool that in a reliable manner announces degrees of inflammation, degrees of angiogenesis and responses to treatment? How do we get there? This is, you know, and, and this, this of course is, is, is not unique, unique thinking by any means, but this is how we decided to, to approach it in the lab. First, we said we must show that the signal that we're seeing announces a specific, specific biological process. The signal, and this currently is a huge issue, this is the, the make or break of molecular imaging. Everybody in the community agrees on this. It must be quantifiable, and it must announce changes in biology. So changes in signal intensity must announce changes in biology. And of course, the imaging method must be optimal for the target that you're choosing. So how specific is our signal? What are we seeing if an imaging molecule, either an optical molecule or an iron oxide molecule, binds CD13 on blood vessels? Are we seeing angiogenic vessels? Yes, we are. Why? Because the same vessels that bind the NGR, again labeled with a quantum dot, in red, also express CD105 and doglin, which is a marker of active re actively growing capillaries. So these things stick to actively growing capillaries. So <coughs> to further answer, you know, kind of in a step-by-step -step fashion, these questions, how specific are we? Are we really only seeing angiogenesis? Are we not looking at other forms of blood vessel growth? How can we quantify the signal? And how can we relate it to biology? We chose to move from the heart to the ischemic leg in the mouse. Why? Because the mouse 
in the upper leg, if you tie off the femoral artery, will show an arteriogenic response in the upper leg and the lower leg, the quadriceps or the, the gastrocnemius muscles are characterized by tissue necrosis, inflammation and angiogenesis, just as in the heart. So within the same limb, you can compare arteriogenic and angiogenic responses. And this was published by a former colleague of mine, <coughs> from originally from uh, Wolfgang Schaper's group in Germany. And so are we seeing arteriogenesis or angiogenesis? We tied off the femoral artery in the mouse. We looked at CD13 expression by quantitative PCR in the quadriceps, in the medial compartment of the leg, and in the gastrocnemius. There's no difference in CD13 expression between the non-ischemic leg and the ischemic leg in the upper part of the limb, whereas in the ischemic leg in the lower part, there's a significant increase in CD13 by PCR. If we do immunohistochemistry, at seven days in the ischemic in the ischemic gastrocnemius muscle, we see blood vessels that are positive for CD13. They disappear at day 14. This is normal control tissue. CD13 on capillaries. Optical imaging will only get you so far and definitely will not allow you to move into cardiovascular imaging for patients. So we need to move into an imaging modality that, will allow, that we can use in patients and ideally allows us to measure more things together with the signal of the molecularly targeted probe because then we can relate signal intensity to function recovery. MRI is ideal. You can measure ejection fraction, you can measure infarct size, you can measure wall strain. Here at CMIV, people have developed a fantastic technique to measure blood flow patterns in the left ventricle and in the big vessels, carotids, aortas. So MRI, during one imaging session, you can get information about physiology and signal intensity from your molecular target. That's why we moved to iron oxide particles synthesized for us by Yvonne Durand at the University of New Hampshire. Iron oxide core, pegylated shell, and functionalized with fluorescent molecules and also again the NGR homing sequence. The problem with iron is that on the one hand it's very convenient because it gives you a very strong signal, but on the other hand because of the strength of the signal, if you will, the, and the MRI people will correct me on this because what I'm saying is a huge oversimplification, but basically the message is that there is a shadowing effect. So that, for example, here this is one from one of our, our uh, stem cell experiments where we injected labeled stem cells with iron it's almost impossible to see where the cells exactly are because of this huge black blob that indicates the location of these cells. So through a collaboration that we had with Philips at the time, we had the access to a post-processing technique that basically flips the black signal into a white signal. This technique is called susceptibility gradient mapping. This is from uh, this is a flank tumor in a rat. The animal was injected with iron-labeled mesenchymal stem cells, the stem cells home to the tumor. But you, there's no way to tell from this image where they're sitting, where as you apply the post-processing technique, you can see that the cells are sitting at the perimeter of the tumor and not in the necrotic core. So applying this technique to our mouse ischemia model in the hind limb, we could see that if we injected an animal with targeted nanoparticles 
and compared it to an animal with non-targeted par particles and compared the ischemic leg to the non-ischemic leg in both animals, we could see that there was an increase in signal intensity in the ischemic leg that also was quantifiable compared to the non-ischemic leg, whereas the animal that was injected with non-targeted particles, there was no differences in signal intensity between the two. This is where we stand with signal quantification from iron oxide nanoparticles. <coughs> These are the first baby steps in that direction. Ultimately, ideally, what needs to happen is that we get the signal coming from the particles directly, that we measure magnetic moment or whatever coming from these particles. Because all of this is what we're measuring here is the change in magnetic susceptibility of the tissue surrounding the particles. Okay? So we're still measuring surrogates, albeit more precisely, but we're not measuring particles directly yet. Okay, so now how are we going to relate this signal intensity to changes in biology? First of all, <coughs> we wanted to know if the, we wanted to quantify the changes in vessel volume and area after occlusion of the femoral artery in this model and she, see how these changes in vessel volume and area relate to signal intensity. So these are micro CT angiograms on a uh, GE micro CT scanner. This is the ischemic leg and as you can see over time there is a massive increase in vessel volume intensity in the non-ischemic leg that peaks at day 14 and that declines again somewhat at day 21. So there is a very robust angiogenic and arteriogenic response. To measure blood flow in this model, we collaborated with my colleague and friend Dr. John Lindner, who's at the Oregon Health Sciences University in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon, and he taught us a technique <coughs> where basically you take an ultrasound probe, you inject ultrasound contrast, you hit the contrast with a high energy pulse, destroy it, and then sample the contrast again as it moves back into your field of view. And this allows you to generate a, a picture of the vascular tree and at the same time measure blood flows in arteries, arterioles, and capillaries. I can tell you that the CT measurements, both in terms of volume and vessel area, track very nicely with these contrast echo flow measurements and also track very nicely with another flow measurement that we do in the mouse, the laser Doppler blood flow measurement. So the next step will be to correlate signal intensity to these vessel volume measurements and blood flow measurements. Now, in terms of clinical application of molecular imaging of angiogenesis, we have just submitted our first application in this area where the goal is to take patients who are candidates for end arterectomy, inject them with ultrasound contrast that recognizes CD13 that is on these blood vessels, measure the signal intensity coming from the ultrasound contrast, and then once we get the plaque specimen from the vascular surgeon, look at how many blood vessels are there, how many new blood vessels are there, and how many characteristics of vulnerable plaque are there. Why? Because there is quite a large body of literature that supports the hypothesis that capillary growth 
into this plaque predisposes the plaque for rupture. And rupture, of course, causes thrombus. And thrombus, of course, causes stroke and heart attacks. So if we can correlate signal intensity from targeted molecular imaging of CD13 on capillaries in plaque to neovessel density in the plaque and to other histologic criteria of plaque rupture, we may in the future have a method to predict plaque rupture in patients and preventively treat these patients. That's the holy grail. We are not the only group pursuing this, but I still think we have a unique set of capabilities here at Lean Shipping in terms of imaging, in terms of a tradition of collaboration. And now with Dr. May Griffith also joining the team, the capability to synthesize these targeted molecular imaging particles that hopefully what I'm saying will be a reality in one or two years and I may be able to present the data of this study to you. Just to wrap it up, CD13 indeed is on capillaries in human plaque. This, these are two sections from a human plaque from different areas. You see that here in the plaque was a very thick plaque. There is an arteriole there's no CD13. There's a little bit of CD13 on the vase of Azorum outside the arteriole, where here there is a capillary which stains positive for CD13. So hopefully, molecular imaging of angiogenesis to identify rupture-prone plaque. And I would like to thank the... Uh, all the folks who came through my lab uh, over the years, my collaborators in immunology who uh, helped develop the, the vascular leukocyte story, which I was not allowed to tell you today, but which I will certainly share with you at a later time point, Bob Palak and Brenda from the clinical echo department, Yvon for his uh, iron oxide particles, John and Beat at OHSU for the blood flow measurements in the, uh, in the mice. Lubomir and Velu from Philips are friends in the animal departments and we were supported by the NHLBI institutional funds and Philips Electronics. Thank you very much. Uh, you explained that uh, the angiogenesis could be and, and the measurements of, of the angiogenesis could be a predictor of plaque fracture. Yeah, that's... Is angiogenesis a kind of parallel phenomenon before rupture, or could anti-angiogenesis be a treatment preventing plaque rupture? That's an excellent question. And uh, the... Nobody knows because... Um, nobody's done this in people. The, the problem uh, with uh, investigating angiogenesis in plaque uh, is that there are no animal models that will help you there. The mice, <clears throat> the identif so you, it's very difficult to do this experiment in animals and um, Mice have, um, there's a big debate if they have intraplaque angiogenesis at all because their vessel walls are so small, maybe they don't even need capillary growth to grow their plaques. The other technical issue with the mice is that there are many antibodies that, that don't work on paraffin sections in mice. So you can do cryosections, but then you, usually the, the tissue structure is lost, so it's very difficult to measure capillary growth and angiogenic response. Pigs, if you feed them cholesterol, some plaques will show intra-plaque growth, 
but not reliably. So ultimately, unless a miracle happens in, in the animal department, we will have to do this study in patients. There is huge reluctance currently to do this study in patients because you could also argue if you stop vessel growth in the plaque, you stop oxygen supply to the plaque, so you kill even more cells, you cause even more inflammation, and you make it even more rupture prone. So you could also destabilize it. So you can, the argument goes both ways, basically. And um, of course, being a plumber by background, my preferred way of dealing with these plaques would be to stent them uh, preemptively. But I mean, before we ever, if we ever get there, of course, we need to develop this diagnostic tool and show if it's reliable, yes or no. And there we go. Yeah. But it's absolutely, it's a, it's, it's a hot topic in the literature right now. About uh, <clears throat> the vulnerability of the plaque, yeah. uh, there, is, there has been uh, discussions of lots of factors that uh, are related to the vulner vulnerability. For example, absolutely. fibrous cap, mechanical twitching, and, yeah. and things like that. Uh, how would you relate the angiogenesis to the other factors? Um, what, in your mind, is the most important thing? I, and why do you deal with exactly angiogenesis? In all honesty, of course, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? My hammer is molecular imaging of CD13. And, I show that, and I, I've shown that my nails are there too. CD13 is on the capillaries of plaques. Now, that being said, um, I think the, the, the angiogenesis hypothesis of plaque rupture is very attractive be, just because, as you said, it unites many of the factors that we think uh, cause plaque rupture. It's, there's a role for inflammation. More inflammation means more angiogenesis. There's a role for another phenomenon that has been uh, described as a critical marker of vulnerable plaque, and that is intra-plaque hemorrhage. More angiogenesis means more leaky vessels, means more intraplaque hemorrhage. <coughs> There's a role for angiogenic cytokines, growth factors, that may further destabilize the plaque. There's a role for matrix metalloproteases that need to be there for the blood vessels to grow, but that can also destabilize the cap. So I, I, I do think, in all fairness, it's not only my hammer looking for nails, but I also think, at least to me, this is a very attractive hypothesis because it unites many of the, uh, of, of the destabilizing uh, factors that, or the factors that we believe contribute to plaque destabilization. Um, is this the one and only hypothesis? Of course not, like you mentioned. And if this is the correct hypothesis, we'll only know if we do prospective studies where we follow patients and image them and then see how they do over time. But that goes for, for every plaque hypothesis. Mm -hmm. As a vascular surgeon, uh, surgeon I, I welcome this diagnostic tool. It Thank would you. be wonderful to have a, 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 a diagnostic uh, tool that could find those smooth plaques uh, who are going to be rough and exactly. rupture. Exactly. And uh, that would be a very good thing. But I go back to, to Matt's uh, question. It would be 
even more better if we could identify smooth plaques that will never become rough and rupture. Yeah. So the causality between uh, angiogenesis and becoming a, a rupture would be very interesting to investigate. Don't you think? Absolutely. And um, as, as I was trying to say earlier, the, the difficulty with, with investing this, this causality is that the animal models just are not helping us a lot. Because in mice, uh, if there are intraplaque vessels at all, they're very difficult to study. And the larger animals are very inconsistent in growing intraplaque vessels. How are we approaching the causality question in, in the study that we have just submitted? Um, we will take, um, and, and uh, uh, your colleague, Dr. Klaus Fuschel, is, uh, is a collaborator on this study. And so we will uh, take, or at least invite, every patient who is scheduled for endarterectomy, both the elective high-grade stenosis, 70%, uh, but no TIA and no stroke, and the patients who have ruptured plaque, TIA, and stroke. And we will look at the, the signal intensity for molecular imaging, both in the asymptomatic and in the symptomatic, and hopefully we will find a stronger, stronger signal in those with ruptured plaques. The, the other, uh, one of the other criteria will be if then this signal correlates with criteria for vulnerability on histology in the way that the lower signal, there's also less angiogenesis in the stable plaque, there's less inflammation, there's a smaller lipid core, there's a thicker fibrous cap, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we, in other words, we believe that if we discover a continuum in the readout, so in the stable plaque, it's less, it's there, but it's less severe, and in the ruptured plaque, it's stronger, that's probably the best indicator of causality in this type of cross-sectional study. The catch, of course, is that it may be possible that everything we're seeing in the ruptured plaque is a response to the rupture. So that the patient ruptured your plaque, and then in response to that, as a repair response, there's more angiogenesis. So it's not, and the only way, in my mind, to address this issue is do a longitudinal study and take the asymptomatic patients, follow them over time. But I, I think the clinical need is huge because as you know, the benefit from elective carotid endarterectomy in stable patients is relatively small. So we're not doing a good job at identifying those who are prone to rupture. And hopefully, this is a small step towards that goal. Uh, as I understand, that there is some medicine for anti uh, androgenesis yes, absolutely. for cancer patients. Yeah. Uh, I wondered if had anyone studied if those uh, um, uh, those patients yeah. have lower risk to develop some. Uh, heart attack or stroke. I mean, I in that case, uh, if it's a uh, whole body treatment, the plan right. could be Absolutely. involved as well. So. Um, I have not come across those those papers. Um, the problem, of course, with cancer is that the lifespan is so short, and that atherosclerosis typically takes, it starts in the US at least in kids in their teens and it takes decades to, to become symptomatic, right? 
four, five. Whereas when you're talking cancer, you're typically talking five year survival. If you get there, everybody's happy. So, so the, the time scales are, uh, are different. And that may be one of the reasons why, you know, and then of course the groups typically in those studies, especially the anti-angiogenesis studies, the numbers are pretty small in most uh, studies. So, but it is a good point, absolutely. Being a vascular surgeon, but a oncologist, uh, I, I wonder, because angiogenesis is relevant to, for example, miscarriage. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Preeclampsia, cancer, mm -hmm. placental diseases. <coughs> Could your method be applied to paraffin in the specimens? Or do you have to yeah. use it? Yes. You could. Yes. Yes, we have, uh, there's, um, especially when it's, it's, it's uh, uh, specimens from patients, it's absolutely, the antibodies work much nicer than in uh, specimens from, from mice, so, so definitely. And um, if we're looking at angiogenesis, I would be very surprised if CD13 would not be there. Then again, of course, the mechanism is different, right? There's no inflammation, there's no tissue injury, so... But it, I think it would be very interesting to, to look at. Could be inflammation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Thank you very much. Ibu, thank you very much for yeah. a very interesting lecture in uh, this uh, frontline subject. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, from the, uh, both from the university and from the hospital, would uh, like to say very much thank you and uh, give you a small gift from us as a. Imported from Holland. Yes, yeah. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. Oh. Thank well, you very much. We're all keeping our fingers crossed, I think. Thank you.